This video is going to be all about the forms of corrosion in metals and the reason why I have chosen a subtitle, How Space Influences Pace, is because as you will see it definitely changes the oxidation rate. So we're going to have a look at uniform attack, galvanic corrosion, crevice corrosion, pitting, intergranular corrosion, selective leaching, erosion corrosion, stress corrosion, and hydrogen and So you'll be pretty much set to understand all types of metal corrosion. So uniform attack. This is a form of electrochemical corrosion that occurs with equivalent intensity over the entire exposed surface. This often leaves behind a scale or deposit. Oxidation and reduction reactions occur randomly all over its surface, and it is the most common form of corrosion. It can actually be predicted easily, so it's not a mystery for engineers to incorporate a prevention design. Namely, we just coat the metal in paint, we galvanize it, we put in corrosion inhibitors, um, cathodic protections, that we just put in an impressed current and it's fine, there won't be any uniform corrosion. Nice and nice and easy. So how ca can we determine how fast something is corroding uniformly? Because this is great, okay, you know, we can stop it. Um, that's nice. So we can actually predict how fast something corrodes uniformly by testing for weight loss of standard testing coupon in a specific environment. So the corrosion rate is expressed as corrosion penetration rate, CPR, and this is expressed in MMPY, millimeters per year. And this is measured by exposing a coupon in the environment for a short period of time. And we just assume it's going to create at that same uniform rate over the whole year. So example, a 1040 carbon steel thin plate sample of two centimeters by five centimeters in size is placed in a reaction vessel for three weeks. After cleaning off the corrosion products, the sample is weighed and found to have lost 1.2 grams. Now, determine the corrosion rate of this carbon steel in the testing medium. So, the first, the first thing you need to do is that mass is equal to volume multiplied by density. We need volume loss, as this is the area which is occupied by the material and is more important to engineers. So, P equals MV. That's the first step. So, to figure out how much this material will lose over a year, we can find out how much volume is lost over three weeks and then find out how much volume will be lost in 52 weeks. So we go V equals M over P. Nice and easy. So after we have figured out the weight loss in volume, which is simple triangle formula, then we need to figure out the total volume loss per millimeter. So this is the total surface area, 20 centimeters squared. That's we need to include both sides. So over three weeks, we divide the total volume loss over the surface area, and that will give us the volume, volume loss per millimeter, 0 0.0075, and that's per three weeks. Now we need to find the annual corrosion rate, so we just divide um, 0 0.075 by three to get how much the coupon corrodes per week. We multiply by 52, and then we'll get 1.3 millimeters per year. It's pretty cool. All right, galvanic corrosion. When two different metals or alloys are electrically coupled while exposed, to, this happens when, yes, when they're exposed to an electrolyte, the more reactive metal corrodes the anode, the anode, and the more inert metal remains protected, the cathode. The rate of galvanic attack depends on the relative anode to cathode surface areas that are exposed to the electrolyte. Smaller anodes corrode more rapidly than larger ones. This is because the current per unit area of corroding surface, the current is not the single most important thing to consider. Okay, so there is a higher current density for a smaller anode as there is a smaller surface area. So that is why you don't really want small anodes, so they'll corrode faster. So the key terms to remember in this area is your galvanic series, which is a relative ranking of the activity of metals in specific environments, where the one with seawater is mostly most widely used, that is one galvanic series. A galvanic couple is when you have two dissimilar metals which are electrically connected. You also have galvanic corrosion, which is the relatively active metal corrodes and loses electrons, which is the anode, while the relatively inert metal is not reduced, it is protected. This is because the environment acts as the cathode where it accepts the electrons. So this is the galvanic scale I was talking about in seawater. So the further apart these things are, the more um, electropositive and electronegative they are, and you don't want them anywhere near each other because they will just destroy one another if you actually go through prevention mechanisms so a bit later so a couple of examples is that steel screws corrode when in contact with brass in a marine environment so don't put them next to each other and if copper and steel tubing are joined in a domestic water heater the steel corrodes in the vicinity of the junction so don't put copper and steel next to each other in a domestic water heater so one quick case study of galvanic corrosion um, is the Statue of Liberty. So the copper skin is attached to the wrought iron structure using copper saddles and rivets. So to prevent possible galvanic corrosion, engineers coated the iron structure with tar just under the saddle brackets to provide an insulation. 
However, over the years of experiencing hot summers, the tar vaporized, leaving copper in contact with the iron, causing rust to form. Now, rust has a larger volume, and the expansion cracked the riveted joints, causing the detachment of the skin from the structures. They had to re repair the whole thing. So if you wanted to build something with different types of metal, you should consider the following. So how close are the metals on the galvanic scale if you're planning to launch something into the marine atmosphere? So it would be better if they weren't on the galvanic scale at all, but if they are, um, choose the one closest together to reduce the cell potential, and if possible, just isolate the metals using gaskets, mainly the absorb um, non-absorbing ones, and have a look at the cathode to anode ratio. Make sure the cathode to anode surface area is small to prevent large-scale corrosion, this includes making sure the anode isn't small, and this includes current density. So just what I mean there is that if this is this sounds a little confusing, but I assure you it isn't. So if there there is a cathode and anode surface area, make sure it's very small, so there's not as much corrosion happening. But if you've got a large cathode and a small anode, then that's going to increase the current density. It's just going to absolutely send itself into the cathode. So just careful there um, and you can just use a sacrificial anode to protect one of your metals so cathode to anode ratio explained so whatever is lower on the galvanic series will be created and the more negative electrode potential indicates the anode so here you go so let's say you've got you've galvanized some steel using zinc this is a much better option than tin because if you did tin then the steel would just be eaten out because it becomes the anode because of the electrode potential on the EMF series so as you can see, tin is higher up, which means that iron is going to be the anode, which means it's going to donate its electrons and it's not going to rot, but it's, it's just, it won't be the same. So you want to use zinc. Zinc is lower, which means that iron is going to be the cathode. Well, it's not going to be the cathode, the environment becomes the cathode. So zinc is going to be eaten away and the steel is going to remain untouched. So that's the cathode to anode ratio sure explained. So if we want our steel, all right, yeah, I got confused. Okay, crevice corrosion. This occurs as a sequence of concentration differences of ions or dissolved gases in the electrolyte solution and between two regions of the same metal piece. It's similar to galvanic. So the concentration cell. Corrosion occurs in the locale that has the lower concentration. So in crevices, recesses, under deposits of dirt, there are localized sections of uh, depleted oxygen. The crevice must be wide enough to penetrate, yet narrow enough for stagnancy, usually several thousands of an inch. Crevice corrosion is quite nasty. So the mechanism of crevice corrosion. So due to this is due to differential aeration. Oxidation, oxygen is depleted inside the crevices, forcing oxygen reduction to occur outside where oxygen is replenished continuously. This is able to fuel corrosion inside the crevice. So this is very slow to initiate, but it's self-catalytic once started due to the protective oxide film. So crevice corrosion is... Nasty stuff. So metals with protective oxide films are most susceptible to crevice corrosion. This is because the protective film is being attacked inside the crevice and it can't reform due to lack of oxygen, rendering it non-protective. At the same time, corrosion inside the crevice makes the outside even more cathodic, further fueling the corrosion inside, becoming self-catalytic. And this makes crevice corrosion difficult to detect since the protective film is undisturbed and acts as an electron transfer medium to the, to the corrosion occurring underneath. In this case, we can sort of see it, but in most cases, you wouldn't be able to. So if galvanic or uniform corrosion occur, crevice corrosion will not. This is because there is already electron transfer occurring, so there's no need for the crevice to do any of its business over here. Right, so preventing crevice corrosion. You know, it sounds quite nasty. How do you stop it? So use welded, not riveted or bolted joints, because otherwise the riveted or bolted joints create, you know, a little space for oxidation or aeration to occur. Now you need non-absorbing gaskets. Yeah, you need to remove accumulated deposits frequently if possible. Um, and it's best to design containment vessels to avoid stagnant areas and ensure complete drainage. Um, non-absorbing gaskets, such as Teflon, where possible, just a slightly better example. Use non-absorbent nylon washers to seal off the gap under bolt heads from possible and design vessels to... Yep, I already said that, repeating myself. Pitting! Another one. It's another form of very uh, localized corrosion attack where very small holes or pits form. They penetrate from the top of a horizontal surface downwards in a nearly vertical direction. They are very insidious. No one knows that they're, they're there. They're so small. And there is very little material loss until failure occurs. There is oxidation occurring, um, which occurs within the pit itself, with a reduction happening at the surface. And it is thought that gravity causes the pit to go downwards. And these are tiny. You can't really detect them. 
So prevent pitting, um, it may be initiated by a localized surface defect such as a scratch or a slight variation in composition. Specimens with polished surfaces have a greater resistance to pitting, but it is very expensive to polish surfaces, so that's annoying. Stainless steels are very susceptible to pitting, um, but alloying them with 2% molyb molybdenum enhances their resistance significantly, so that's nice. So intergranular corrosion. This occurs along grain boundaries for some alloys. There are macroscopic specimen. A macroscopic specimen disintegrates along its grain boundaries, and this is very common in stainless steels, so that's not great. So, intergranular corrosion with stainless steels becomes susceptible when heated to temperatures between 500 or 800 degrees Celsius for a, sufficient, for a sufficiently long period of time, because this heat permits the formation of small precipitate particles of chromium carbide by direction of the chromium carbide in stainless steels. And now these particles form along the green boundaries, and this green boundary region is now susceptible to more corrosion. This is also a huge issue in welding, also known as wood decay. So how do we protect stainless steels from intergranular corrosion? Well, subjecting the sensitized material to a high temperature heat treatment um, is okay because this allows all the chromium carbide particles to be re-dissolved. We can also lower the carbon content below 0 0.03 weight carbon so that carbon formation is minimal. We can also alloy the stainless steel with another metal such as niobidium or titanium, which has a greater tendency to form carbides than does chromium, so the chromium remains in solid solution. Selective leaching. So the selective leaching is found in solid solution alloys and occurs when one element or constituent is preferentially removed as a consequence of the corrosion process. So selective leaching in brass is a good example. So de-zincification of brass in which zinc is selectively leached from a copper zinc brass alloy, only a porous mass of the copper remains in the region that has de-zincified the material changes from yellow to red or copper color. So that's not great. Now onto erosion corrosion. This arises from the combined action of chemical attack and mechanical abrasion or wear as a consequence of fluid motion. This is very harmful to alloys, which passivate by forming a protective surface film. The abrasion action may erode away the film, leaving an exposed and bare metal surface. If the coating is not capable of continuously and rapidly reforming as a protective barrier, corrosion may be severe. So soft metals such as copper and lead are sensitive to this form of attack. It is usually identified by surface screws and waves um, having contours that are characteristic of the flow of the fluid. There is increased um, erosion corrosion, uh, increased f increasing fluid velocity increases the risk of erosion corrosion. Um, solutions are more erosive when there's a suspended particles or bubble present because it sort of just rubs away at the surface and it sends, like if you get sandpaper and you started rubbing it on your, um, on your hand, you would feel some of your skin coming off. Or if you've ever fallen off a bike onto a road, you just the skin off your knee peels off. So that's sort of what happens in erosion corrosion, but with fluid. So erosion corrosion is most commonly found in piping, especially at bends, elbows, and abrupt changes in pipe diameter, um, and especially in positions where the fluid changes direction or flow becomes turbulent, um, as well as propellers, turbine blades, valves, and pumps. So it is quite an issue. So how do we prevent it? So we should definitely ensure that the design eliminates flu fluid turbulence and impingement effects. And definitely remove any particles or bubbles from the solution because this lessens its ability to corrode. So you see how many straight pipes there are. And they don't bend it unless they have to. Stress corrosion. So stress corrosion cracking. This is combined action of applied tensile stress and a corrosive environment. Small cracks form and then propagate in a direction perpendicular to the stress with the result that failure may eventually occur. So failure behavior is characteristic of that for a brittle metal. Even if a material is distinctly ductile, the corrosive environment has the ability to change this condition. Now stress may be residual, not just external applications. This could be temperature change or trapped gases. So stainless steels or stress corrode in solutions containing chloride ions and brasses are vulnerable near ammonia. So don't put brass near ammonia in case you're thinking about doing that. So how to prevent it, lower the magnitude of the stress, and you can do this by reducing the external load, increasing cross-sectional area perpendicular to the applied stress, um, as well as heat treatment, which can anneal any residual thermal stresses. And lastly is hydrogen embrittlement. So various metal alloys, specifically some steels, experience a significant reduction in ductility and tensile strength when atomic hydrogen penetrates into the material. Hydrogen included cracking um, and hydrogen stress cracking are also used. That is uh, the alternative name for hydrogen embrittlement. Uh, hydrogen embrittlement is actually uh, technically a type of failure because it, uh, it responds to apply to residual stresses 
and brittle fracture occurs catastrophically as cracks grow and rapidly propagate. So hydrogen diffuses interstitially through the crystal lattice and concentration as low as several parts per million can lead to cracking. It is a huge problem. So there you go. Um, so essentially what hydrogen does is it goes into these tiny little vacancies and it just causes chaos. So hydrogen embrittlement is sort of similar to stress corrosion in that a normally ductile material experiences brittle fracture when exposed to both a tensile stress and a corrosive atmosphere. Distinguished differences, um, it is distinguished the difference between hydrogen embrittlement and stress corrosion is the reaction of hydrogen embrittlement and stress corrosion to apply currents. So although cathodic protection reduces or causes a cessation of stress corrosion, it may lead to the initiation or enhancement of hydrogen embrittlement. So that is one downside. So where can we see this happen? So anywhere with a source of hydrogen and a potential to form its ions, pickling, which is a procedure used to remove surface oxide scale from steel pieces by dipping them in a vat of hot dilute sulfur or hydrochloric acid. Um, pickling of steels and sulfuric acid, we can, you can see a risk of hydrogen embrittlement. Electroplating, water vapor at elevated temperatures, uh, presence of poisons such as sulfur and arsenic. Hydrogen sulfide is actually one of the most aggressive poisons and it is found in petroleum fluids natural gases, oil well brines, and geothermal fluids. So hydrogen embrittlement is an issue. Where else can we see them? We can see them in high strength steels, martensitic steels, venetic, ferritic, and spheroidic steels are more resilient from these types of embrittlements. That's nice. FCC alloys are relatively resistant to hydrogen embrittlement, such as austenitic stainless steels, alloys of copper, aluminium, and nickel, due to being inherently ductile, and strain hardening these alloys increases their susceptibility. So hydrogen embrittlement isn't nice. How do we stop it? <laughs> There's like one point. We reduce the tensile strength of the alloy via a, a heat treatment, removing the source of hydrogen and substituting a more embrittlement resistant oil alloy, which yes, as you can imagine, that is expensive. So hopefully you are well versed in all the different types of corrosion, that m all the different ways that metal corrosion can occur um, and the challenges that engineers face, which is quite a few. Thanks for watching.